Okay. Cool. Well, welcome everyone. Today I'm going <laughs> to talk about um, mycology in the garden. So first I'm gonna talk about some general history and terminology, plus some fantastic facts about fungi with lots of photos of mushrooms found in central Texas. Then we'll learn how fungi benefits the soil and watch a few video demos on how to grow mushrooms in the garden that Angel produced for the Texas Organic Farmers and Gardeners Conference. So um, feel free to give us any feedback, share emojis, ask questions uh, in chat. And again, Angel will try to address them as she sees them. And here we go. Oops, here we go. So a little bit about Central Texas Myco Mycological Society. So uh, we formed this nonprofit in 2019, right before the pandemic. And CTMS's mission is to strengthen the conservation, research, and study of mushrooms and other fungi in Central Texas. So currently, um, Angel mentioned, we do around four events each month, and we do small in-person mushroom rocks and uh, workshops. She mentioned that we're doing a UV walk, um, and you can check out all the events on centraltexasmycology.org. And I wanted to ask this in the chat, does anyone recognize the mushroom in our logo? So you can type in chat if uh, you recognize this mushroom right here. Someone said it, the Texas star. So, um, it is the Texas Star Mushroom, and our organization worked with other groups to help it become the official state mushroom. Uh, Texas is the third state to recognize a mushroom, and um, the scientific name is the, I <laughs> have trouble pronouncing this, so Angel, you can step in and pronounce this correctly. Choreactris Yaster that name <laughs> is unique to Central Texas and is ge uh, geographically rare and found in one other geographic location, which is Japan. Scientists are perplexed as to why it is so geographically distributed, but it can be found in Central Texas in the fall into early spring growing next to dead cedar elms. And the fruit body, which grows on the stumps of dead roots of cedar elms in Texas, somewhat resembles a dark brown or black cigar before it splits open radially into a star-like arrangement of four to seven leathery rays. So you can type in chat if you've ever seen the Texas star mushroom. So, um, a little bit about me. I'm Kim Wen. I am um, a community garden manager here in Austin, Texas. I um, have managed my community garden for the last three going on four years. I'm really passionate about um, food and gardening. And I met Angel through um, the Central Texas My College mycological society because uh, we use the spent mushroom bags in our own gardens. And I've been with uh, CTMS as one of the leaders for a few months now. And I've really enjoyed my time. The middle picture is one of our um, spent mushroom in the garden workshops where we're actually in the community garden that I manage. And um, we were talking about and doing a live demo on how we use the mushroom bags in our raised beds and compost as well. So this presentation uh, will cover how to use these bags you see right here in your own garden. So you might be asking, what are these mushrooms that grow in these blocks? So many times farms grow mushrooms once on these mycelium blocks and then end up getting, and they end up getting tossed in the waste stream. 
So recycled or spent mushroom blocks contain common agricultural uh, byproduct ingredients such as sawdust, straw, coffee grinds, cotton seeds, cotton seed hulls, etc. These ingredients are great organic amendments to the soil. So here in Austin, we're collaborating with local mushroom farms to help keep to help keep used mushroom blocks out of the waste stream and get them into gardens all around Austin, like mine, and build healthy soil. So um, you should have received a link in the invite today where you can sign up to find a pickup location near you. Uh, we also have these locations posted on our website. So some of the uh, topics we're covering, what is mycology, um, fungal terms, infinite uh, fungal life cycle, fascinating fungal facts, types of fungi in the garden, ecosystem, and mushroom growing in the garden. So what is mycology? So it's the study, the scientific study of fungus and the study of decomposers. We study this to understand our biosphere and that um, fun fact, we have similar cell structures to mycelium and fungi are closer to human than plants. And some of them even contain melanin. So some fungal terms that we'll be going over, spores, hyphae, mycelium, colonization, inoculation, symbiotic, and parasitic. So um, I won't go through every single one of these definitions, but you get the gist. I'll explain them as uh, we go through this presentation. So let's see. Let's get started with a little bit of history. So mushrooms were grouped with both plants and animals until uh, in 1969, a scientist named Robert, Robert Whitaker published the first major revision to the two kingdom classification system. He proposed that there to be five kingdoms, meaning that fungi now was its own kingdom. Just a few, just a few years later, uh, psilocybin or or the psychedelic mushrooms were placed under schedule one, and this has led to creating a mycophobic culture. It's hard to talk about mycology without people thinking of just psychedelics, which is a shame because there's still very little we know about fungi. But in fact, we've only identified 10% of mushrooms on earth. So we're going to zoom out and look at the phylogenic phylogenetic free, uh, tree of life. Fungi are closer to animals than plants and, mycel and mycelium and mushrooms inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. So here's an infographic of the mushroom life cycle, which remains largely invisible. We're going to go through some terminology. So mushrooms are fruit bodies, are the reproductive organs in the mushroom life cycle and for most species occur for a few days and then disappear. Many species of fungi do not create fruiting bodies. So these spores are like seeds. So spores are like seeds and hold a lot of genetic information. Spores have a half of the fungi's complete set of genes. They're, uni they're uni unicellular, they're a unicellular dispersal unit with specialized adaptations that protect the cell until the environmental conditions favor growth. So um, right over here, I believe, uh, spores fall in on the ground. Um, and if conditions and the medium are moist and favorable, spores will generate. Next, during the spore germination cycle, uh, fine thin spreads of filaments known as hyphae grow from the spores. Compatible hyphae mate to create fertile mycelium. So developing mycelium breaks down organic matter and absorbs nutrients from its surroundings. During this stage of growth, mycelium expands at, it expands at an exponential rate. In its environment, mycelium encounters many competitors and predators, which it repels with an amazing array of protective enzymes and compounds. 
In this sense, the, myceli the mycelium is the immune system of the mushroom. So next slide. Spores are everywhere. So for a long time, uh, they've created, there was mystery around these spores because they're hard to see with the naked eye. Every breath contains between one and 10 detectable spores. A recent study that came out this year, or yeah, this year, which sampled air in Oklahoma found nanoparticles of spores. And it is now believed that there are two to three times more in the way of fungal spore fragments than, previous, than previously thought. So the most important part of the fungi life cycle lives under your feet as you walk. Have you ever noticed spider web like strands in the soil? Well, this is mycelium and it is responsible for creating mushrooms. Mycelium are so tiny that one cubic inch of soil can contain enough mycelium to stretch for eight miles. It is the vegetated part of a fungus consisting of a network of the white, fine white filaments called hyphae. These spider like these spider web-like strands of mycelium are needed to help keep the fungi organism alive. The more it touches, the more it can consume and it eventually recreate itself. Fungi is a large part of the reason why we have soil and a huge part of the reason why all living things have surfaces to walk on. So mycelium forms this important communication network sometimes called the wood wide web or the earth's internet. This web beneath our feet connects vast systems of roots from plants and trees all over the planet, like an underground internet distributing nutrients and water through this network. 95%, more than 95% of plants form relationships with fungi. Through the tubes of mycelium, information about the environment, such as changes in the soil moisture, water purity, and pollution are communicated to the ecosystem. Plants, insects, and microbes use this information for their survival and coexistence. So fungi can live everywhere, even in the desert, even in volcanic lava flows, and even the ocean. There is even marine fungi that creates mushrooms. So fossilized mycelium in lava flows has also been found to be 2.4 billion years old. This would make the fungi kingdom the earliest known complex multicellular life, one of the first living networks. Fungi are highly evolved and opportunistic and can survive in extreme conditions and some are waiting for, and some are even waiting for the perfect conditions to create mu a mushroom and reproduce. Fungi can survive a vacuum of space and it's likely that at some point spores made it to our bubbling hot planet traveling in space dust. So around 400, 470 to 360 million years ago, long before humans were alive, a giant fungi called the prototaxites, um, Angel, you can pronounce that. <laughs> um, prototaxites. Oh, prototaxites, the size of trees feasted on the dead, growing slowly into the largest living thing on land. It, ulti it ultimately made life on land possible. The fungi kingdom does not need humans to survive, so it's important that we take care of our planet and try to learn as much as we can about the fungi kingdom. And here's a photo of the prototaxites fossil, pro prototaxis <laughs> fossil. And it is huge. It's a very large mushroom. So mycelium can exert enough force to penetrate through asphalt and tough plastics like mylar and Kevlar. Here you see stink horns, Phallus impudicus, <laughs> um, which can grow six inches an hour. 
When a stinkhorn mushroom crunches through an asphalt road, it produces enough force to lift an object weighing 286 pounds or more. One study estimated that if a haifa was as wide as a, as a human hand, it would be able to lift an eight ton school bus. So mushrooms can also grow in circles called fairy rings, which created a lot of superstition before science could explain the phenomenon. Some cultures thought they would be swallowed, swallowed into the afterlife if they stepped into a fairy ring. Um, post in chat if you've ever seen a fairy ring before in real life. Um, but now we know that the mycelium in the ground absorbs nutrients by secrete by the secretion of enzymes. The mycelium will move outward from the center, and when the nutrients in the center are exhausted, the center dies, therefore forming a living ring sometimes thousands of feet across from which the fairy ring arises. This photo on the right is Angel on J J July 4th near the White Horse in Austin. She spotted a vomiter, which is a toxic mushroom with green spores. And Angel, you can give um, a little bit more context about how, how you saw these mushrooms. Yeah, so this mushroom is, I find it a lot of time in like landscapes, um, especially when mulch is used because it's a decomposer. And um, yes, like it's one that you definitely don't want your animals or you don't want to eat it because it will make you throw up like the common name tells us. Um, but the spore print is really cool. So if you do find one, they're really big mushrooms, save one that's like nice and big and open and put it on um, some piece of paper, some white or um, aluminum foil works good for doing a spore print and you can check out the green spore print. Awesome, thank you. So mushrooms come in every color of the rainbow. Spores of mushrooms are also different colors. You can even use mushrooms to make dyes and do art. So this is a painting of the blue, mo of the blue milk cap, which was created by Mary ba Banning in 1878 using ink from the mushroom. Like this uh, Lactarius indigo mushroom, artists sometimes just dip their paintbrush in the mushroom and uh, get these spores. You might recognize the one on the end because it is the emoji for the mushrooms on, I think, the Apple ecosystem. I don't know about Android, but it's pretty common um, and also made famous by the Super, Super Mario Brothers. So you'll see um, the, pe the peach fly agaric mushroom um, in video games, uh, in I think everywhere. It's the classic mushroom shape and color. And like plants, mush uh, like plants, fungi can see color across the spectrum using receptors sensitive, sensitive to blue light and red light. But unlike plants, fungi also have the light sensitive pigments present in their rods and cones. As mentioned, humans are actually more closely related to fungi genetically than plants. This ability, this ability to sense colors allow fungi to have avoidance responses where they don't touch one another. One of the reasons why we find mushrooms to be scary or something we shouldn't touch is that they can kill humans. In the 15th century, in what is now Europe and Russia, so some high profile members like the Pope and of uh, Zarita died or were assassinated from, from consuming toxic fungi. Although only one to 2% of mushrooms are poisonous, only about a dozen are fatal. There is only one that is found in central Texas that is fatal. Um, that would be this one shown here, the Eastern uh, Destroying Angel or Amanita Biosporigera. Uh, Angel, you can correct me again <laughs> of the pronunciation. And I think you've also spotted this, right? Yeah. So this one, um, I get, I, I butcher the name as well, but Amanita Biosporigera. And um, 
I've seen this one out in Bastrop actually. So where um, it's mycorrhizal with pines. So with the loblolly pines, you're sure to see it. Um, and of course in Houston, East Texas, you can find them very easily because they have all different kinds of pines. Uh, but yeah, it's um, one to definitely know. If you know any mushroom, this is the one to know and know it really well. Awesome, thank you. Oops. So now we're going to zoom into the soil and everyone probably has seen this chart. It's of the soil food web. So the four divisions of the fungi in the second trophic level of the soil food web. So they, there is the saprophytic wood loving decomposers, mycorrhizal, the endo and ecto, parasitic, they attack living hosts for nutrients and the endophytic uh, present, th which is present through the lifespan of all plants. So there are four divisions of fungi and the sapotrophic mushrooms are decomposers. So their roles as, the, as decomposers and nutrient circulators are critical to the formation and regeneration of soils. They form close relationships with the vast majority of leafy plants, often bonding with and weaving within them at the root level to create living networks that give structure to the soil and scaffold against erosion, as well as digesting pathogens and toxins and turning carbon into the wider food web. And you can see here's some uh, more saprophytic mushrooms, reishi, turkey tail, chicken of the woods, uh, which colonizes the heartwood of Texas live oaks are all decomposers. Because, because spores are floating everywhere, fun fungi can make itself home and reproduce on many living things, trees, insects, plants, and even humans. In central Texas, uh, the Ganoderma are considered parasitic because spores make their way onto trees that are still living and eat it alive. If you've ever seen a hollow tree, it's likely due to a fungus parasi uh, parasitizing a tree. The mushroom on the right is called chicken of the woods, and it, is slowly, it slowly eats the heartwood of, a, of Texas live oaks. Many times, it's not the fungi uh, that is at fault. Human, dis human disruption, cutting down trees and trimming of trees for roads and buildings opens up, the, opens up trees to spores that are floating everywhere and are waiting for the uh, opportunity to have dinner. So, um, on the plus side of <laughs> these uh, chicken in the woods, um, picture of angel harvesting some chicken in the woods and uh, eating these edible mushrooms that contain proteins, fat, fiber, and taste just like chicken. And Angel, you can uh, tell us a bit more about your experience. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. And I just put in the chat that it's, they're starting to fruit. I've been seeing people take photos and put them on iNaturalist. So I know they're starting to pop out of uh, where the heartwood has been exposed. Um, but yeah, it's so uncanny, like so much like chicken. It, I've fooled like vegan, <laughs> vegetarian friends making it. Um, but one of my favorite recipes, and we have a blog on our website, is to do coconut chicken of the woods. Like basically, like instead of shrimp, uh, substituting the shrimp for the for uh, the um, with the chicken of the woods mushroom. And um, so, yeah, if you want the recipe, you can get it on our website. Awesome, thank you. So some mushrooms, including the oyster mushrooms are considered carnivorous because they consume nematodes in nitrogen lacking environments. So first the, for, first, the oysters lure lure nematodes in by excreting a chemical that smells like food to the nematodes. At the same time, it is excreting a toxin that is extremely efficient at paralyzing these now uh, homeless nematodes. With a motionless but live catch, they go in for the kill. 
the mycelium filaments known as hyphae enter the nematodes through their mouths and then feast from the inside out. You can see from this photo, uh, it shows the hyphae going in for the kill <laughs> of, of the nematodes. So the mycorrhizal category um, is one of the uh, subjects I'm most interested in, and it's related to the roots. So this division of the fungi forms beneficial relationships with trees and plants, and there are two types, endomycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal fungi. An estimated 95% of plants form mycorrhizal partnerships with fungi. The mycelium brings in water, phosphorus, and other nutrients to the host plants through the roots. The mycorrhizae greatly increases the surface area of the plant's root system, which is hugely beneficial in areas where drought is common and where the soil has poor nutrients, just like Texas. The larger surface area gives plants an advantage to, complete, to compete for nutrients. Many farmers and gardeners will inoculate their crops with mycorrhizal spores for better growth. So you can find uh, a mix of mycorrhizal endo and ecto uh, powder on Amazon in your local grocery, uh, plant nurseries. I have a couple of brands um, and you typically use these powders uh, when you're transplanting uh, your transplants for into the ground. Um, usually you want to make sure that the powder is either touching the roots or if you create a uh, liquid slurry that um, you apply it directly uh, onto the plant when you transplant it. So that um, the, the roots themselves get, get inoculated with the mycorrhizae. So some examples, uh, yeah, I think, there we go. Sorry about that. Some examples of mycorrhizal uh, edible mushrooms include truffles, some morels, chanterelles, porcini, and matsutake. These types are very difficult to cultivate, hence the reason why they're so pricey at the grocery store. And Angel, I know uh, we went on a morel trip right to East Houston. Um, if you want to talk about that trip a little bit and the morels you found. Yeah. So this is, um, that was actually for chanterelles. So chanterelles. we planned a trip, um, since we didn't get any rain, uh, we didn't have any morels growing out here in central Texas or chanterelles. Um, although we have a chance to see them now with this like flash flood type rain, but Houston, there's like three or there's so many species of chanterelles. So we did, an event, um, a foray out at Little Thicket Nature Sanctuary. Um, we try to do like a couple events in East Texas uh, each uh, year to look for different kinds of mushrooms. But um, but yeah, the picture of the morel was my first one that I found in Texas. And it was uh, during the pandemic. And I, um, you know, quit you know, didn't have anything to do because uh, everything was shut down and South by Southwest was canceled. So I didn't want to watch the news, all the panic. And I went outside and took lots of hikes in nature and just kind of accidentally found them. Yeah, this is a great photo. And there is actually a lot of progress in learning to cultivate um, these mycorrhizal mushrooms in Asia as well. So you can see a morel farm here. So the next uh, category, parasitic mushrooms. So they prey on plants, trees, animals, and even humans. This type of fungus weakens trees and nourishes other organisms. Some common examples are of uh, parasitic mushrooms are uh, dandruff and foot fungus. So if you've ever seen planet Earth, you've probably seen zombie ants that get infected by a fungus that controls its muscles, driving them away from the colony into the highest point of a tree for the best spore dispersal, eventually taking out 
the whole colony. To the left, you see this fungus growing out of an ant's head. Cordy, cordy, cordyceps is becoming a very popular medicinal mushroom used for many things. Several years ago, a 23-year-old high school dropout figured out how to cultivate the mushroom on wheat berries. So you can see this fungus found in the soil infects cicada males as they come from as they emerge from the soil to mate. Chemical analysis of these uh, of these uh, fungi has found that its uh, fungus contains compounds um, of I think uh, Angel, do you remember what they found these compounds? Yeah, um, so they found um, compounds that were in psilocybin and also amphetamines. And so this was like a big uh, kind of surprise because the, the what uh, biologists were observing out in the field was that this, um, when it would come up and it was infected, it would do this like wild mating and dance. And they call it kind of like almost like a salt shaker dance. Um, and I think it's even been documented. You can look online and watch videos of this cicada going crazy and doing this dance and spreading the spores everywhere. So it infects more of the um, cicadas. But, you know, as we know, when periodical cicadas come up, they mate and then they die. And that's like their sort of job. Uh, and then they go, you know, feed and then go back underground <laughs> and come back. Uh, but yeah, um, this is a very interesting one to learn about. And in recent years, there's also been more research on fungal biopesticides. So fungal pesticides, um, AKA entopathogenic fungi are getting a lot of attention. There's a lot of research, several patents and a few products on the market. Uh, I can't pronounce this, Boveria bassiana, <laughs> a beneficial fungus targets and controls a wide variety of soft bodied, bodied insects in the greenhouse field and nursery crops. Um, these bugs include white flies, thrips, aphids, silids, mealybugs, scarab beetles, and weevils. So next, we're going to talk about the pair. And um, Angel, could you talk a little bit about this ant, actually? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a picture of what's called the tawny crazy ant. So if you do anything in gardening or bi um, biology, you may know about this um, invasive ant. And so we actually just had the talk like uh, last week where some UT scientists, they figured out how to use an anthropathogenic fungi to stop an invasion in South Texas. And they're finding them in all of the state parks and they're using this fungus that naturally occurs within these ants that take out the colonies. And they're proving that they can use this fungus rather than broad spectrum pesticides um, and fung fungicides that then, uh, you know, that, 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 that actually take coal and like take care of the population. And so um, it's a very fascinating talk. You can really get, go deep, deep, deep in the science. We have the recording on our YouTube channel if you wanna learn more. Awesome, thank you. Another parasitic uh, fungi, pottery mildew. Um, and uh, you'll probably see some <laughs> actually in the next uh, few weeks or so if, if it continues raining like this every day, um, you'll see some powdery mildew in your gardens. And the largest organization on the planet is the uh, humongous fungi in fungus in origin is a parasitic and edible mushroom called the honey mushroom. In 1998, a team from the U.S. Forest Service set out to investigate the cause of large tree die-offs in East Oregon. Several species of fungi belong to the um, Armillaria genus, which is probably known as the honey fungus, were 
they which were found to cover 2,385 acres. They colonized and killed a variety of trees and woody plants. They also grow in Austin at the base of older oak trees. Um, lion's mane can be saprotroph can be saprotrophic and parasitic fungus. In central Texas, they grow on post oak trees that are still alive and have large cankers caused by drought and oak wilt. And this is Angel holding a very large lion's mane mushroom. And where did you find that, Angel? Secret spot. <laughs> a secret spot. So um, the fourth category is endophytic, uh, the, the, the endophytic fungus lives within a plant for at least part of its life cycle without causing apparent disease. Endophytes are ubiquitous and have been found in all species of plants studied to date. However, however most of the endophyte slash plant relationships are not well understood, mostly because they are hidden and do not always form mushrooms. This magnified image shows a fungus in leaf tissue. Some endophytes may enhance host growth and the ability to absorb nutrients and improve the plant's uh, ability to tolerate stresses such as straw, salinity, and decreases stresses by enhancing plant resistance to, in to insects, pathogens, and herbivores. Endophytic fungi have been of great interest during the last two decades because they produce so many different compounds and enzymes for medicines and biocontrol. Researchers have recently discovered that a fungal endophyte associated with pepper plants also create the compound capsaicin, which we know makes peppers spicy. This fungal relationship then allows the plant to deter insects and other fungal pathogens. And another uh, fungi is trichoderma or green mold. So this is an endophytic fungus that causes a lot of problems in sterile mushroom farms. Although if you find a recycled mushroom block from us that has some green mold on it, that is actually a good thing. Um, it is a genus of soil dwelling fungi all over, found all over the world and are highly effective at colonizing many kinds of plant roots and inhibiting fungi, fungi that cause many types of diseases. It was one of the first types of biofungicides commercially available. Trichoderma has, uh, trichoderma has been shown to be able to activate plant defense responses which enables the plant to control some infections above the ground, but their effects are not limited to just so soil-borne pathogens. An example is bot botrytis, a debilitating above-ground fungus that is sometimes controlled using trichoderma. Trichoderma can directly para uh, parasitize other fungi. First, it attaches to them, then it coils around them and produces structures that can penetrate them. In addition, this fungus produces enzymes that break down the fungal, the fungal cell walls. And here is a short video on- Yeah, uh, and actually Kim, yeah. Um, uh, we actually, um, we normally don't show the videos in the okay. presentation since we have them all on our website. And, okay, awesome. uh, but um, it's mostly just to show people kind of what the series is so they can do it at their own time. And a lot of this reiterates what we already learned. Um, it's just a little more succinct because we made the video we did for Tofka. It had to be 20 minutes rather than a full hour. So we kind of reiterate some of the things we talked about today. But um, in the next few slides, Kim will just show you different ways that you can use them. And then you can go to our mycology um, low-tech mushroom cultivation section of our website to get links to all of these videos and watch them on your own time. But they give you step-by-step -step instructions um, written and in the form of the video. Okay, cool. I will just 
breeze past these then. So growing mushrooms and wood chips. So um, I can talk about a little bit about my experience growing uh, mushrooms in the community garden. So we have grown them in wood chips. Uh, we have wood chips as we use wood chips as mulch around um, for pathways around the garden. So uh, first we would put down a layer of mulch, then we would use the mushroom substrate and then put on another top layer of mulch so that the mushroom substrate is sandwiched between two layers of carbon. And this is a pretty much the perfect time to uh, use mushroom substrate as compost or um, to inoculate any wood chips that you may have lying around, inoculate, inoculate any leaf piles uh, because of all the rain. Um, usually in the community garden, we do it in, uh, we try to time it during the rain season, during the rainy season, um, as well as during the cooler months so that the uh, substrate has a chance of survival, has a, a higher chance of inoculating and the mycelium has a, um, lots of moisture and cool weather to spread. And I have personally done uh, grow, grew mushrooms in straw bales, um, both at, again, the community garden and then in my own backyard. Um, I love growing them in straw bales. You get so much, uh, so you get a lot of pounds of um, oyster mushrooms specifically that um, I think I've gotten 30 pounds of oyster mushrooms from um, my straw bale alone. And the straw bale I got from, uh, tractor supply around town. And um, the only thing about growing mushrooms in straw bales is that the straw does get stuck on the mushroom gills. And when you are, um, it is a bit tedious to pick out the straw from these mushroom clusters. But I also know, Angel, you've uh, grown mushrooms in straw bales as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, experienced the same thing. It was really fun. Like I was able, it's, it's sort of like they're decomposing the straw, like as you're growing them. So, you know, once you're done with the straw and once it's all started decomposed and you get about three or four flushes of mushrooms, um, you can just use that straw as like, um, for your tomatoes or for your, um, for your um, strawberries or something that in the garden that really likes straw. But I did experience the same thing, like getting a little bit of like pieces of straw, like in the mushrooms, but yeah, it's always a bummer to like cut away, like some parts, chunks of mushroom that ha might have a little piece of straw, but it is a, uh, it is a little bit of a meditation, like uh, picking out the straw, but, but yeah, it's fun to do. Yes. And you want to make sure that you get straw bales and not hay. Hay has uh, hay seeds, so you don't want that <laughs> in your compost. Oops. There you go. And growing mushrooms in containers. So we have workshops um, that we teach people how to do a low tech way of getting uh, of growing mushrooms in these Home Depot buckets. I know we had um, at the at my community garden, that's what we use, as well as straw bales um, to, uh, with straw as the medium to stuff, you know, these uh, buckets with straw, mushroom, substrate, straw, mushroom, substrate. And you can see from this um, uh, video that we drill holes in these buckets. So um, that's how the mushrooms, uh, uh, fruit. They fruit out. Um, Angel, do you know if we're doing any more low tech bucket workshops? Yeah. There's actually one coming up at Zilker Botanical Garden on September the 12th. And we'll be doing one um, there. And you just pay your entrance fee and you can make a donation if you'd like to to help pay for supplies. But um, if you go to Austin Organic Gardener, so you can go to our calendar. Um, I believe it's on a Saturday, so Saturday morning at Zilker, um, yeah, the 10th, um, but yeah, if you want to learn how to do this technique, you can bring your own bucket, we'll have a few extra ones there, but like I said, yeah, just, um, there's so many different um, ways to do it, we recently shared on our Instagram, 
someone had done this um, with the old bird cage. And that's one of my favorite ones, but people have grown, used like a Barbie's like body, uh, old shoe. Like it's so fun to just experiment and see what things laying around you can grow uh, mushrooms in, but, but yeah. Awesome. And then growing mushrooms on logs. So I have also done this. <laughs> I've done this with shiitake on uh, live oak logs, branches that have fallen. Um, it was not as successful as I um, thought it would be just because it does. I think my logs were um, too thin. They weren't thick enough as well as shiitake um, grown on uh, logs takes a long time to colonize in fruit. So um, I bought my little uh, wooden peg spores to inoculate the, the logs. Um, it was a really fun project. Uh, I think I bought it, I can't remember the exact website. Um, I, I think we have the link to it in the end of the presentation. Um, but it was a really fun project and I highly encourage if you have uh, logs or fallen branches that are pretty thick, you can uh, try this at home. And then trench composting. So I actually don't have experience with this. So I'll let Angel talk about how she uses, she used that at uh, her community or her garden. Yeah, so we did this, um, I do this at home in my home garden and also the one at Zilker. But this really, um, this is the perfect time of year to do this actually, like you're cleaning up your summer garden, kind of taking away all that woody, leafy matter. Um, you can dig a trench and throw in your, um, throw in all your leafy matter, chop it up if you can, and then throw mushroom blocks in there. And then it just increases it um, also like um, it will speed up the process of decomposition. You can even just throw in a full block, like not even break it up. Um, and this method is really popular to get like the really pretty, like beautiful, full fruiting mushrooms because that ground temperature is like so ideal for the mushrooms. So at the farms in the fruiting chambers, they keep the temperatures around like 73, 74, 75. And you can imagine like um, the ground temperature is much cooler. So if you don't dig a little bit of a trench, it's gonna really like that environment. And surprisingly with oysters, they can really, um, even though it might be growing some trachoderma or whatever, it can really like fight through all that and, um, and it's, it out competes all the other bacteria and stuff in the soil. So you can get some really pretty fruits. Um, it's And it's so, sometimes like, feels like ornamental. Like uh, some people like to even, you know, line like a bed of um, like right in the front, especially where water may be like running down to the edge of a bed. Like if you, especially if you have like concrete beds or concrete barriers, even wood barriers, like doing mushrooms where like kind of water like runs and sits at the edge of the bed is like a really good spot to do that. And then they kind of like fruit up, fruit up, like almost like um, a flower. So it's like, pretty kind of like to treat it like an ornamental uh, something in the garden. So, you know, um, so yeah, it's one of my favorite ways to, to grow them in the garden. Awesome. So, you know, I've, as we talk about this, there is still a lot to discover. And research is currently being done to study how fungi can help break down petrochemicals like polyurethane, vinyl, styrofoam, and all sorts of plastic. Oops. Um, mycofiltration. So biodegradable burlap sacks act as dams to pick up bacteria coming off of cow pastures in the Puget Sound. Antibiotic metabolites secreted by mycelium act as the filter. And Angel, I think you can talk about this case study a little bit more. It sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you can use, you know, burlap sacks um, 
to collect, like if you have like an area where you may have like cattle runoff or areas where you have like a lot of nitrates um, kind of running off, like, and you were trying to keep it from going into the soil or going into rivers and waterways, because we know that's like a big problem. Um, you can do this method. Um, some people like to even line their like chicken coops and things like that, like real poopy areas and um, do mycofiltration. Awesome. And so a recent study from Sierra shows that using spent mushroom blocks as fertilizer on many plants is a viable alternative to other fertilizers and soil conditioners and should be looked at as a valuable product and not simply a waste material. It is a cost-effective way for farmers and, and gardeners to build soil health while operating in a sustainable fashion, and the benefits seem to get better with time and persist long after initial application. So you can learn more about the benefits of adding mycelium to the soil on our website, attending our events, and just uh, talking with us and joining uh, CTMS. by becoming a member. <laughs> so, um, you know, membership uh, at CTMS includes uh, access to uh, member-only events, discounts on workshops, the uh, locations of the, re um, we, po we post the locations to the mushroom blocks publicly, right? Right, Angel? Yeah, so um, we have Facebook groups now, so mm -hmm. you can find your neighborhood Facebook groups. So, you know, look on our, um, I think they're all linked on our, our, um, our Facebook group. You can look and see the subgroups that we have affiliated with ours. And so um, it's something that we're wanting to expand. So there's one in Bastrop. So uh, Dina, she's on, I believe she's still here. Dina, do you want to talk about the, um, the mushroom block pickup location in Bastrop? Let's see if she's still on. She might have stepped away. I know it's dinner time. Uh, I think she's muted, but if she does come back on, she can talk about the one here. But um, but yeah, there's Facebook groups, and then if you aren't a Facebook person, you can still sign up on our our website to um to get the list. Like it's just to sign up, and then it takes you directly to the list, and it's so that we can. Um, you know, learn more about how you're using them. So all of this information helps us know, know how we can improve this program. And it also helps us with outreach. So if you're doing a really interesting project, like we want to know about it, we want to know how these blocks are being used, because as um, Kim said, like part of our mission is to further the study and um, research of mycology. And so we're just starting, we just won our first grant and we're doing our first research project. And we hope that um, this inspires more people within our organization and we can help um, help you kind of uh, apply and uh, do more grants to do these sort of small mycological studies. But we really wanna know like how this, um, this valuable material like impacts the growth of our plants. Cause I know from my experience and it's just anecdotal I see so many benefits to using these. And if anybody else maybe wants to do a little testimonial, if you've used them already, feel free to pipe in at this point. Yeah, we can start taking questions, I think, as well. Ooh, I think Cecilia, she's turning her audio on. Cecilia, do you want to share some information about um, how you've used them in your uh, community gardens? Okay, well, we're ready for uh, Q&A. Um, there's a few questions I saw in the chat. Uh, Derek, you asked, like, could you grow chicken of the woods in a low tech method? I've never seen it done before, but I mean, I don't know if anybody's tried it. Like there, 
they seem to be pretty specific about like the temperature and the timing just like all plants like we know they have a perfect temperature they like have a certain season and time so as chicken of the woods is just starting to fruit right now like maybe it would be a good um, experiment to try it out but um you know the genetics like varies wildly too so um you know it's one of those things too, you don't wanna like spread it to other trees, but I'm just curious. And I know um, uh, Andrew Denny from South Texas Seasonals, he's experimenting with growing chicken of the woods um, in, on sawdust. So that would be one that I feel like we could figure out because it is a decomposer and then there, we should be able to grow that one, but it probably would grow pretty slow since it's a, a polypore. And that just means it's a, like a shelf fungus um, and they grow a little bit slower than other um, gilled mushrooms, the Basidia mycetes. Okay, does anybody else have questions or comments? Any experience using the blocks in their gardens? Do we have all first time mushroom growers here? Um, hi, this is Shalon. I had a quick question. So sure. I'm just getting into mushrooms and I actually found a chicken of the woods a couple weeks ago, it was delicious. And then um, I wanted to ask, is this, uh, this particular mushroom? Wait a minute, am I on? Should we, uh, do you wanna share your screen? We can stop sharing and you can share your screen. Oh, okay. I thought you could see the camera. Okay. Let me see. Um, or actually we should be able to see your camera. Okay. Yeah. We can see you now. Whoops. Wrong way. Oh, puff ball. <laughs> it's a puff ball. Yay. It's brown it. ball, right? Yeah. So you can eat puff balls if they're still white on the inside. So if they are, if you cut it open and it is starting to, the spores are starting to brown, then that's not, that's a sign to stay away. Don't eat it. But that one looks pretty good. Yeah, I just uh, it yesterday. Yay. Where are you? What part I'm of Boston? Georgia. Uh, Georgia. Georgia. Oh my gosh. It, you guys have been getting so much rain, haven't you? Yes, and a ton of um, mushrooms. Whoops, just one second. I'm sorry. I'll let someone else go. Oh, no, no, you're good. That's exciting. Thank you for sharing that. I always get so excited when people bring mushrooms to the mushroom talk. And we've been so deprived over here in Texas. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. My, my uh, washing machine is on the fritz. But I was going to ask you guys, um, if I was to grow mushrooms inside of the house in like a Martha tent, what mm -hmm. are the chances of that, like the spores spreading? Because someone was saying in the last mushroom um, mm -hmm. class I had gone to, to, of course, you keep your area sterile, but that the mm -hmm. spores spread to other places. Is that true? Yeah. So, um, you know, what they in the mushroom farms, like people wear like those like real intense respirators because uh, when you have like a whole bunch of like fruiting mushrooms, they can spread a lot of spores and, you know, a little bit of spores is okay, but like a lot can be really hurt your respiratory system. But um, if you have it, that's why a lot of people use those little like Martha tents that you described or like a fruiting chamber. There's like a bunch of different kinds that you can find online. Like really they're just like kind of almost like, um, like a grow tent kind of thing. Um, and that will help the spores from spreading. And so if you're doing them in one room of your house, like I would say, just like keep like another, you know, another kind of like, um, I forget what they're called. Like those little, uh, filter things like mm -hmm. air filtration systems, like in there as well. Um, and maybe like, if you can just isolate the air conditioning to that particular room, like a lot of people like to set up their grow rooms, like in a garage or something 
and they have just a separate AC unit for that. That way the air is not part of central air conditioning where the spores, cause they can float like y'all like spores can go across the ocean. Like they are in the clouds, like they make it rain even. <laughs> so um, they can get it, they can float. They're designed to float, float, float and they can get in your air systems. And um, so, yeah, like it, but if they are in that chamber that's supposed to kind of stop them from spreading. And, and if you're, you know, uh, watching things closely, you'll be fruit, you'll be cutting your, you know, your fruits before they spread their spores too, because you want to get them right before they spread their spores. So, um, and that's something that just takes time. The same with plants, like, you know, like you get to know its life cycle, how long it likes to grow. And then you really know when it's like ready to fruit. And, you know, there's lots of really great Facebook groups, mushroom growing Facebook groups and places online where you can really look at pictures and just see what things are supposed to look like when you're supposed to harvest things. But, um, but yeah, I hope that helped you answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. And a part of the membership that you guys have, is that something that mm -hmm. um, you learned? Um, I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? Oh, um, is that something that I can learn like as part of the membership, that sort of like process? Yeah, so we do do some online cultivation classes. We've mostly been doing them in person, especially the hands-on stuff. Uh, most of our um, mm -hmm. online programming and like videos that we've produced um, have been low tech, like these very like kind of like where you don't, we don't have any, um, you know, you don't even need electricity, like hardly any uh, anything special. Um, but we're wanting to do, and it's actually not my area of expertise. Like I mostly do low tech cause I'm a dirty, I'm like, I'm a dirty girl, <laughs> like keeping everything like real sterile. Like I'm like, I can never do it. <laughs> yeah. Just like always got my hands in something dirty. Um, but it's something we want to do. Like we want to have part, but I would say right now we don't have any online programming that teaches you how to grow mushrooms like indoors in a sterile cultivation setting, but it's an aspirational thing that we want to get to. Um, and since that's kind of my backgrounds, like video production and stuff. So it's something we want to do, but it's just more of like, I can't, I don't want to be the teacher. <laughs> I'll help do the video production, but I gotta, we gotta work with somebody else to do the curriculum. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Angel. Yeah. Dina, did you want to tell everybody about the yeah. drop um, mushroom pickup spot? Yes, ma'am. I'm so low tech. I just got audio. <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. We have, um, we keep blocks out here. We just did a fresh pickup. So we've got over 50 blocks right now. We've got a Hugel culture project going. We've got drench applications going as well as a started a little uh, king area see if we can't get some of those going so we've got the blocks available we try to keep them available and then we're going to do a low-tech program out here on september 24th as well so if they can't make it into zilker they can come on out here and visit we're going to do oh, our good. talk kind of what y'all just did and then your low-tech hands-on that you've done on your mush loves before yeah. Yeah. So everybody uh, make sure that you follow us and we'll be posting um, Dina's event. We can add it to our calendar. Um, so Dina, make sure you send over the event info and I can add it to the calendar. Um, so people can okay, but for now on. for them to clean up their gardens and to take advantage of this rain, we've got nice um, oysters and lion's mane over here that are, haven't yet got the trichoderma. <laughs> that's not saying they won't soon but even then i'm real glad y'all spoke up that that is such a good benefit to our soils as well anyway yeah. great program guys thank you yeah okay let's see um i'm looking at other questions so lee you have a mushroom that you want us to identify do you want to share it a picture or
And I want to ask too, like everybody at the Bastrop Library, like, I'm not sure. let us know if you guys want to turn on the microphone and uh, have people come up and ask questions. Go ahead, Lee. I'm not sure how I'd send you a picture. We just, I just have many, many mushrooms on IMAT that nobody has helped me identify. Oh yeah, well maybe drop them in the chat and if, uh, if I can pull it up and identify it real quick, I'll help you out. But um, do you, are you on Facebook? Not too much. Not too much. There is a really great Texas Mushroom ID group on there. And our group is pretty good too, Central Texas Mycological Society. It's pretty helpful for doing um, identification. So yeah, so uh, Veronica, um, uh, I have a question about releasing non-native mushrooms. Has it been studied? I might be too worried about invasive species. So that's a very good concern. And the, um, there are, you know, like I was saying, like my, uh, spores can travel long, long distances. So a lot of mushrooms have come here through like human interaction, through, um, and, and, you know, they have like very specific conditions and things they like. So if it's something like, for example, like golden oysters, they used to not be here, but they are now here and they're considered invasive because they are so aggressive and they can take out um, fungi, other fungi that sort of like are doing the same work that aren't as resilient. So it's something that's very concerning. And there are mushroom farms here that do like make some native um, or sort of the indigenous or the um, use um, oysters that have been found here as well. Uh, but in a climate like Texas, because we have such boom bust cycles of climate, it's really, really hard for things to catch hold when it comes to fungus. Um, you know, especially something that's not native, it's like growing, you know, um, that really likes like a very specific kind of tree or whatnot. Like, um, since we're already a pretty harsh climate, like there's, it's difficult for some of these species that we use in the garden to ever like kind of jump and like jump on a plant. Like they're very picky. They all have very specific substrates and stuff that they like. So, um, so yeah, but it's a good thing to like keep track of. And there is a, actually like a red list of like invasive fungus and also rare fungus too that need to be protected. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Let me Google it real quick and see if I can find, um, find something for you guys to look at. Yeah, it's the Global Fungal Red List Initiative, IUCN. So if you wanna look at like fungus that's on the red list that are threatened by habitat loss, um, pollution. So, um, so yeah. Um, Let's see. So uh, Jesse asks, are snails in the yard a problem for mushroom growing? Well, snails are fungal fungivores. They love to eat fungus. So I wouldn't say they're a problem. It just really depends on your level of like, do you want to share some of your mushroom fungus that you're growing with the snails? Uh, most people probably wouldn't. Um, I am one of those weird, dirty girl freaks that I already know that most of the food we eat has like bugs and stuff in it and even worse things like pesticides. So having a little snail um, slime on my food doesn't really freak me out. Um, but uh, it's also like a really good facial product as some of you are, might know. It's a very popular Korean beauty product. <laughs> snail slime. <laughs> so yeah, maybe like put, take some of that snail slime off your mushroom, rub it under your eyes and you're all good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I was glad to know that moldy spent blocks are good for the garden and not bad. 
thought I'd be contaminating my logs. Yeah. So trachoderma, check out that book. It's got a lot of really good info in it. Um, so many creepy centipedes attacking my logs. So centipedes are great for the garden. They are an arthropod and they are helping shred things. Um, so yeah, so they can be, and they also bio or no millipede or centipedes. Yeah. Millipedes. They glow in the dark under UV lights. They're really cool to look at. Um, and then where are the blocks, Jesse Montoya? So um, there's 12 spots in Central Texas. I'm gonna drop in the chat where the link to sign up if you haven't already. So you can sign up and you can also, um, it'll take you to the list of Facebook groups too. So you can join the face, Facebook group closest to you. Uh, let's see. Is there a danger of infecting parasite, parasitizing native trees? I live adjacent to a heavily wooded conservation land. So I wanna be sure I'm not doing any harm to trees. So um, like I said, there's mushrooms like have very specific types of substrate. So they can't just go infecting any kind of tree. So for example, chicken of the woods, it only, um, the spores only land on escarpment live oaks here and grow on live oak trees. And so they like that just particular species of tree. Um, and so, you know, like they just don't go growing on anything. So there's very specific things. So I would not be concerned. And as I mentioned, like, um, you know, the, the conditions are already really harsh. Uh, like our lack of rain or our really erratic um, weather cycles are just not really ideal for um, for like uh, it taking hold and, and becoming part of the ecosystem. So when we do grow them in the garden, they're mostly just like myceliating and breaking things down and essentially composting. But the conditions as soon as it rains, like that's when we see our, when we have like the nitrogen charged rain, like that's whenever we'll get mushrooms fruiting. And we've been very lucky the last couple of years where we've been able to grow mushrooms in the garden. Um, you know, even in August, um, in past years, because we had so much rain. Um, but yeah, you really want to be using them to do your composting because that's their, their job is to like help break down that woody and lignin matter. Any other questions? Anybody in uh, Bastrop at the library have any questions? Okay. Oh yeah, so I got this picture. Let's um, take a look at this. Uh, do you have a picture of the cap? And I'm also going to drop a, a blog in here to teach you how to take photos for mushroom identification. So usually it takes more than one photo um, to do a proper identification. You want to get the cap. You want to get. Uh, you want to get the underside. You want to get the habitat because, like I mentioned, the tree is so important to know what it's growing by, what it's growing on. So this blog post will help you take better photos for doing mushroom, getting help with mushroom identification. But it is, it does look like a Amanita, I can tell that from the, uh, the underside, or no, it could be, it could be a, yeah. And what county are you in? Location is also important. Dallas, shaggy parasol. That's what Bradley thinks it is. Did anybody else get it? Get to see the photo? I can share the screen. But um, but yeah, it's really important to have multiple photos. 
Okay. Any other questions related to mycology in the garden? And just so you know, we have a mushroom identification class coming up in September. I think it's September 15th. So definitely check out our calendar for all the things that we have coming up. I just added a bunch of new things to it the other day. Um, you know, we have this night walk and then we have mushroom bingo coming up this month still. And then next month we have, um, we have mushroom ID 101. On the 17th, we have the fall fungi farm fest. Uh, there's going to be a talk on the 10th about like ethnomycology and fungi and its use in art all around the world. And we're going to start our Balcones Canyonland Preserve Mycoblitz. And I think the sign up is already full for that one. It ended on the 15th of August. But yeah, definitely sign up to be a member with us to find out about things first. We always alert our members ahead of time so they get priority for all of our events. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, Kim, tonight for the wonderful class. And thank you, everybody, for coming out and learning with us. Um, and Bradley, if you want to email me links to the iNaturalist posts or whoever has um, ID, wants help with ID, you can uh, send us an email or you can join one of the um, Facebook groups. Uh, that's going to be a much better place because there's lots of people just waiting to answer your, help you with your ID. So I'm gonna drop that um, link to the Facebook group in the chat, but I appreciate everybody for joining us tonight and have a good rest of the week. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Have Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for having us. I just Bye. sent those pictures. I, I just sent those pictures if you want to look. Thank okay. you, everybody. Great program. All right. Thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh yeah, they do look like um, maybe some shaggy parasols. What um, what recommendation did um, did you get um, on iNaturalist? Um, I deleted that app. I've never used it or had any good luck. Should I? Oh, um, it can get you in the ballpark for sure. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. but those and you're in Dallas. Mm hmm. Yeah, they're in the center courtyard growing out of the grass. There's um, okay. some cedar that trees actually, around. That and does. Um, it definitely looks like a parasol mushroom. Um, it doesn't it, seem to be coming from like an egg or anything. You know? Yeah, it does look like a parasol. And that one is, um, it's related to the chlorophyllum molybites, I believe. Hmm. And so a lot of people, you know, I think the shaggy parasol, that one is edible. It's not choice, but it's one that you could confuse. That's why it's like important to sometimes do a spore print. Um, but yeah. I'm totally, I'm totally going to do a spore print. If I ever yeah. see it again, I'll let you know how it comes out. Yeah, do it's a spore variety. print. Um, but yeah, they do grow kind of in like a meadow. It's like considered like a meadow mushroom. And yeah. Um, very cool. I'm sitting here nodding my head like you can see me. <laughs> yeah. um, all cool. right. Well, I'm going to jump Thank off, you. everybody.